Okay, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I hope that you've already enjoyed the first panel. Uh, my name is Mahbuba Hashemi Nassab. I'm an oral and maxillofacial surgeon in Tom's, and I have the honor to host this meeting, the surgical panel with Dr. Deniz from Yeditepe University in Turkey. So Dr. Deniz, would you please start the panel if you want to say a few greetings to the audiences? Yes, sure. Uh, uh, hello and greetings from Istanbul. Uh, from a shiny sunny day from Istanbul, a very nice day here today, uh, and hope you all uh, have a wonderful uh, panel, a very informative panel for everyone. Uh, and I'd like to uh, quickly introduce our first speaker, uh, Volkan uh, Daasha. Uh, before introduce, introducing uh, him, I'd like to give a brief uh, uh, short uh, 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 knowledge information about uh, Volkan the da da uh, Dr. Volkan Daashan uh, had his uh, bachelor's degree in Marmara University in uh, 2012. Uh, and in uh, 2017, he completed oral and maxillofacial surgery PhD program in Yeditepe University. Uh, since then, he continues to work as an assistant professor mm -hmm. in uh, oral and maxillofacial department, Yeditepe University Dental Faculty. Uh, and uh, welcome, Daashan. Uh, here's the uh, time, and please uh, have your speech. And if you let me, I would like to add a few words. Uh, uh, the audiences are uh, welcome to ask their question in the chat box here. And let me review the agenda first. We're gonna have four lectures. Two of them are gonna be by maxillofacial surgeons and we're gonna have two perio lectures. So first of all, we're gonna have uh, uh, the lecture from uh, uh, that colleague from your department. I don't know the pronunciation of the name. Oh, uh, welcome, that. yes, welcome. Okay, Dr. Wolkan, yeah, that's fine. Yeah. Uh, so we're going to first have the presentation of Dr. Wolkan, then uh, Dr. Mouwini is going to talk about um, traumatic episodes in emergent episode in traumatology, and then we're going to have the two period lectures. So uh, I would like uh, to ask the audience uh, to please ask their question, please uh, uh, type their question in the chat box, then at the end of the two lectures, uh, Dr. Denis and I are going to ask the question from the speakers. So please feel free to type your question. Dr. Wolkan. Thank you very much for all ears for your very interesting lecture. Thank you. Uh, hello, everyone. Can you see the lecture? Okay. Uh, today I will talk about emergencies related to severe odontogenic infections in uh, head and neck so these are the uh, questions uh, that will be asked to you from each lecture. Uh, which of the following does not have an effect on submandibular space infection route? Uh, you can see the answers. And the second question is, which of the following spaces have high risk to be infected while performing an inferior alveolar nerve block? Uh, first of all, I would, uh, I would start to uh, talk about inflammation and infection. Uh, inflammation is the cellular and vascular response of the tissues to any living or non-living foreign body or internal external tissue damage. So this uh, tissue damage can be uh, done uh, with a thermal or uh, radiation-centered uh, trauma also. And uh, by uh, means of living, uh, we mostly mean pathogenic microorganisms. So uh, in that case, the inflammation turns into infection. Uh, the emergence of the disease with the invasion of pathogenic microorganisms and their toxins is uh, called infection. So uh, in clinic, we see inflammation as a part of a healing process. Uh, not every inflammation has infection, it, infection in it, but uh, when the uh, pathogenic microorganisms get involved in the process, uh, it turns out to be infection. 
most of, most of the infections that develop uh, in the oral region are uh, endogenous infections and usually originate from microorganisms found in the mouth, uh, which are predominantly the staphylococci and the streptococci bacteria. The severity of the infection depends on the number of microorganisms, the virulence of the pathogenic microorganisms and the host resistance. Uh, by host resistance, uh, there are factors uh, that reduce the local tissue resistance. So uh, one of them is the uh, physiological changes uh, that happens, such as pregnancy, menopause, or puberty. Uh, these uh, changes uh, are not always uh, pathologic changes. So also physiological changes affect the uh, uh, infections uh, progression. The endocrine system disorders such as diabetes, thyroid, or uh, deficiencies related to uh, hormones. Uh, diabetes is the most common uh, we see in the uh, routine clinical practice. Also, the other factors are the viral infections, uh, immunosuppressive medications, uh, chemotherapy use, radiotherapy use, or uh, presence of some autoimmune diseases. These all reduce the local tissue resistance and uh, increase the progression of the infections. Uh, there are uh, local signs of infections. Uh, these are also uh, signs of inflammation. Uh, redness uh, is as a result, uh, redness happens as a result of the increased vascularization in the area. So uh, when there is an non-living or living uh, tissue damage causing uh, criteria, uh, as a response of the body, our uh, immune system gets activated there. So in order to our immune systems, uh, defense cells to get there, uh, there needs to be a vascularization. So increased vascularize, vascularization results in the uh, redness of the tissue. By the increased uh, vascularization, also uh, heat increase happens in the area. And uh, due to the increased vascularization, in order to uh, get the defense cells out of the uh, vascular structures, the permeability of the uh, vascular structures increase. Uh, so with that, also the interstitial fluid, the serum uh, gets out of the vascular structures. So uh, it creates the edema, the swelling, uh, which creates a pressure in the nerve endings and uh, creates pain in the patient, which results in uh, loss of function. There are also systemic manifestations, fever, leukocytosis, lymphadenopathy, the increased sedimentation and increased uh, CRP levels are uh, some of these. There are stages of infection. Uh, mostly, when we see the patient in our clinic, uh, they're in cellulite phase. Inoculation phase is the uh, inoculation of the uh, microorganisms uh, to the tissues. So uh, it's not, it doesn't create so much pain. So uh, the patient uh, mostly doesn't uh, apply to our clinic, but the cellulite phase. Uh, the infection is progressed. It's a stiff, red, uh, painful stage of the infection. So mostly uh, cellulite phase is the phase patients come to us. Following cellulite stage, uh, it's called abscess. Uh, in abscess stage, uh, the uh, defense system of the uh, body gets activated, so it uh, like creates a barrier to the infection. Uh, it's much more uh, bounded compared to the cellulite, as you can see in the pictures. The left one uh, is a cellulite phase, and the right one is an abscess phase. Uh, in the abscess, abscess phase, it's uh, much more soft, and a superficial necrosis happens, uh, which a drainage can be uh, made. Uh, following the abscess stage is the resolution, resolution stage. And uh, with the elimination of the or uh, treatment of the cause, uh, the infection 
stiff away. The root of the infection depends on the bone thickness, muscle attachment site, masticatory muscles, and anatomy of the root. If a pus exceeds the muscle barrier, infection spreads into anatomical spaces. As you can see in the diagram, uh, for example, if the roots of the teeth is too close to maxillary sinus, an infection uh, can go directly to the maxillary sinus or uh, if it's to the palatal site, it's uh, much probable to be uh, a palatal abscess. And in the vestibular sites, uh, vaccinator, this is the uh, vaccinator muscle. So it uh, creates an important role in the uh, root of the infection, uh, which we'll talk later. The primary spread route of the odontogenic infections are uh, for upper jaw, fossa canina space, buccal space, and infrotemporal space. For the uh, lower jaw, it's mantle, sublingual, and submandibular. Uh, by secondary spread route, we mean uh, for these areas, for the secondary spaces to be infected uh, by an odontogenic cause. First of all, the primary uh, route must get uh, infected. So uh, with a muscle barrier to be overcome, uh, the infection goes to the secondary spaces. Uh, the infection progresses easily in the cancellous bone to the cortical bone. Uh, it perforates the cortical bone and uh, gets collected in the uh, periosteum, under the periosteum. That phase uh, is also uh, the most one of the most painful stages of an infection. Uh, following that, uh, also periosteum is perforated and the abscess start to uh, get collected under the uh, mucosal tissues. Uh, vestibular abscess is uh, a submucosal uh, abscess. Uh, it can be caused by uh, all of the teeth mostly the anterior teeth and the uh, uh, vestibular buccal uh, roots of the posterior teeth. Palatal abscess uh, is uh, most commonly arise from the uh, lat lateral incisors and uh, also the uh, palatal uh, roots of the posterior teeth, the premolars and the molars. Uh, since the palatal tissue is very uh, in fibrous structure, it gets uh, much more painful for the patient. And following these, uh, especially the vestibular or the palatal, uh, other than these, uh, the more uh, inferior or uh, abscess uh, caused in the uh, upper jaw and they form the space infections. Fossa canine abscess uh, is the spread of the infection to the uh, canine fossa, which usually originates from the uh, canine tooth. Uh, often it presents above the buccinator muscle attachment, so it's the reason uh, why it's mostly common and they, uh, done by the canine teeth. Uh, these swellings obturate the uh, nasolabial fold. The space is in close proximity to the lower eyelids. Therefore, early management is mandatory to avoid uh, circumorbital infections. Uh, there is a risk of spread cranially via the external angular vein, which may become thrombosed. So uh, due to the cavernous sinus thrombophlebit risk, uh, the drainage should be uh, intraorally. Buccal abscess is the uh, mostly related to the attachment of the buccinator muscle. Uh, you can uh, see the boundaries of the buccinator muscles as uh, you can see in this picture. When you blow up your cheeks, uh, the ending is the edge of, uh, is the uh, finish of the buccinator muscles. So in the uh, upper jaw, and also the lower jaw, buccal abscess uh, can be originated. If it's maxillary originated, 
the size of the nose and the lower eyelid are also edematous. When it's mandibular originated, uh, edema can go below mandibular edge. However, uh, basis mandibula can be uh, palpated, uh, which uh, we cannot do uh, in submandibular abscess. Infratemporal abscess is also originated from the uh, upper teeth, especially the maxillary molars. Uh, since it's behind the zygomatic bone, uh, extraoral manifestations are less compared to the uh, other space infections. Uh, however, the patient complains of pain, particularly with uh, mouth opening problems, uh, since the uh, pharynge, uh, since the uh, pterygoid muscles are uh, affected. Infection of the uh, submandibular space uh, mostly originates from the posterior mandibular teeth. The mylohyoid muscle uh, plays an important role. Uh, if the uh, cortical bone uh, perforation is under the mylohyoid muscle, uh, it uh, results in submandibular abscess. If it's uh, superior to the mylohyoid muscles, it results in uh, sublingual abscess. Uh, clinically, uh, submandibular region tends to obliterate the angle of the uh, mandible. And uh, as in all of them, there's pain and redness of the skin overlying this region. Uh, Extraoral drainage is performed in submandibular abscess. We have to be careful about the uh, fascial nerve, uh, the marginal mandibular branch. So uh, it goes in the mandibular basis and in order not to harm, damage it, we have to make our incision parallel to the mandibular basis and two fingers below. Submandibular abscess is, again, it makes extraoral manifestations. It rises from anterior mandibular teeth and uh, again, the uh, drainage is made extraorally. Uh, sublingual abscess, as you can see in the diagram, myeloid muscle uh, is here. So uh, superior perforation of creates sublingual abscess. Uh, it creates dysphagia and uh, related to tongue displacement, the patient's uh, airway compromise uh, should be uh, evaluated. Uh, the drainage is done uh, intraorally. Pterygomandibular abscess is uh, manifested mostly by trismus. Uh, it does not have uh, extraoral manifestations. Uh, this space is bounded by the medially bounded by the uh, pterygoid muscle and laterally uh, by. This is the space where uh, we make uh, inferior organ or uh, nerve block. And because of that, uh, this region's uh, infection is uh, secondary to the odontogenic infections. So, uh, however, uh, if there's an infection in the medial side of the ramus or uh, a pericoronitis case, uh, we can uh, carry the uh, microorganisms while we are doing a nerve block. So we have to be careful about that clinically. The pharyngeal and retropharyngeal uh, abscess contains, uh, these spaces contains the carotid sheet, the glossopharyngeal nerve, uh, hypoglossal nerve and accessory nerve. Therefore, spread of infection into this space uh, carries significant danger into descending neck infections and involvement of the mediastinum, which will uh, create a uh, threat to the patient's life. So uh, if the patient is uh, very prone to progression of the infection by uh, especially the reduced uh, immune system, uh, we have to consider it carefully. Uh, management of infections, we have to determine the severity of the infection, evaluate the host defenses, decide on the setting of the care, uh, treat the patient both surgically and uh, medically, medically and uh, treat the cause of infection and 
uh, of course, evaluate the patient frequently. Three major factors must be con considered in determining the severity of an infection uh, in the head and neck region. It's the anatomic location, the rate of progression, and the airway compromise. Uh, we have to evaluate uh, these three compared with the evaluation of the host defenses uh, to decide the patient's uh, care. Will it be inpatient or outpatient? These medical conditions, diabetes, steroid therapy, uh, malignancy, chemotherapy, malnutrition, uh, these are uh, all essential to maintain host defense uh, against infection. So uh, if all of these uh, are not in favor of the patient, uh, we have to inpatient, uh, we have to hospitalize the patient. And other than these, if the uh, systemic temperature of the patient is above uh, 38 and a half degrees, if there is dehydration or a threat to the airway, uh, we should also uh, hospitalize the patient. Uh, surgical treatment is necessary for special space infections. Uh, we have to make uh, drainages using appropriate anatomic landmarks with small inc incisions and uh, blunt dissection without direct exposure of the uh, entire infected anatomic space, we can do the drainage. Uh, since uh, the uh, cause of these infections are mostly endogenous infections, uh, we use empirical antibiotic therapy and uh, penicillin is the most powerful, not most powerful, but mostly used and most effective uh, empirical antibiotic therapy uh, for oral infections. By empirical, uh, we mean we do not use antibiotics specified to the microorganisms. However, since we know the oral flora, and uh, which is mostly uh, predominantly streptococci and the staphylococci, uh, we know that uh, penicillin therapy is effective uh, in this microorganisms group we give uh, empirical antibiotic therapy. So if the uh, infection is persistent, uh, we can do antibiogram tests. And uh, according to the result of that, uh, we can uh, use more narrow, narrower uh, antibiotics that are uh, effective on the microorganisms. So incision and drainage, uh, first of all, uh, we can use and uh, apply an antiseptic solution from center to the periphery uh, to our uh, abscess. Uh, this is an extraoral drainage, but it same goes for the intraoral drainage. Uh, we can use still an antiseptic uh, solution as a mouthwash to the patient and uh, same procedure is uh, carried on. So uh, following the uh, anesthesia, we do uh, circumferential anesthesia uh, to the skin. Uh, the patient will uh, pain a little, feel a little bit of pain. Uh, however, uh, it's impossible to uh, get in front of this. So uh, we anesthetize to make uh, the patient feel a little bit comforter, comfortable during the incision. Following incision, uh, we should be ready for the aspiration uh, and also with a bowl, if the abscess is uh, much larger, the pus will directly come out. So uh, if we are not ready, it will get uh, all over the patient. Uh, we use blunt dissection uh, with these forceps. The point we have to be careful about is uh, we go in the, uh, we go from the incision uh, with closed beak and uh, we open it inside and uh, get the uh, forceps outside. We do not close, we definitely not close uh, inside the incision in order to not harm uh, any anatomical structures. Uh, we do this 
three or four or whatever times uh, till we get to the center of the abscess and uh, till there is no pus coming out uh, we repeat it again and afterwards we put a uh, drain uh, in routine clinical setup uh, you can use uh, sterile gloves uh, fingers and cut it uh, with the scissors on uh, both ends that uh, it doesn't stop the uh, incision we made and we uh, just uh, put it with a uh, one or two stures to the skin to not uh, get it out or inside of the wound and uh, we close it uh, with a uh, sponge and the plasters and we uh, see between the patient uh, in uh, two or three days and uh, do not take the drain out till uh, we treat the cause. Thank you for listening. Thank you very much, Dr. Volkan, for your very interesting and useful lecture. I think for every dentist, it's so handy to have the skills and uh, knowledge of managing maxillofacial abscesses. Thank you very much. Uh, I don't see any questions here in the chat box, but I think uh, if we have, still we have to save them for the, uh, uh, after Dr. Momani finishes her lecture. Okay, so if you uh, may, Dr. Denise, I may introduce the next lecture. Yes, sure, please. Okay, thank you. The next lecture is Dr. Mehnoush Momeni. Uh, she's a professor in the Department of Oral Maxillofacial Surgery. She's well experienced in managing trauma cases. Dr. Momeni got her general dentistry degree in 1994 from Shahid Bayeshti University. Uh, then she graduated uh, uh, in 2004 uh, with a degree in maxillofacial surgery. And then she got her fellowship in maxillofacial trauma in 2015. So Dr. Momeni, the stage is yours. We're all ears for your very interesting lecture. Thank you very much, Dr. Hashimiata. In the name of God, uh, good evening, everybody. A warm greeting to my dear colleagues, my uh, professors, and my students. Um, before beginning my presentation, uh, first of all, I would like to thank the organizing committee of the symposium and special thank to Dr. Hashem Inatab and Dr. Shakib to give me such an opportunity to have my presentation. And uh, second of all, I would like to clarify something about the photos of my patients in this presentation. Uh, since I need to show the whole face uh, of my patients in order to show the results of my operations without covering their eyes, I mean, camouflaging their faces, I've already got a, um, got a constant or a permission from all of them. Uh, here I put uh, two questions, two MCQs, uh, which later on our uh, dear moderator will put in the chat room for the day of the competition. Um, I want to talk about the emergent uh, episodes, uh, emergent scenarios in, in maxillofacial trauma. If you want to cl um, classify the emergent scenarios in this field, we have such a list. As you see at the above, I mean, that the most critical or the most important one is the compromised airway, which is more commonly associated with gunshot injuries, but can be accompanied with other fracture uh, patterns, such as bilateral mandibular fracture, lopert fractures, or comminuted fractures in mid space, or comminuted panfacial fr uh, fractures, better to say. Uh, then we have the excessive hemorrhagy, which is not very surprising for us due to rich blood supply in this field. Uh, we, we can expect a large and excessive bleeding. Uh, in which we have to act uh, very quickly unless uh, it can cause uh, a life-threatening episode called the hypovolemic shock or loss of intravascular fluid or loss of intravascular volume. But uh, despite to this rich blood supply, uh, we can have the in encountering with missile, I mean that in gunshot injuries or better to say in evulsive or crushed injuries, we can have the tissue loss with a bunch of necrotic tissues which can cause another emergent scenario, another life-threatening scenario called the sepsis. 
or septic shock. Uh, then in the field uh, of uh, zygomatic maxillary complex, um, or more precisely in Willemsi fractures or orbital trauma, we can have a very specific a specialized uh, emergency called retrobal bar hemorrhagia, which is a true emergency for the eye. And uh, furthermore, uh, we have two other emergencies, uh, which are not primarily due to maxillofacial trauma, but can be uh, accompanied uh, with uh, maxillofacial trauma, uh, which are uh, due to intracranial injury or intrathoracic injury. Uh, before explaining about and working out about each of these uh, emergent scenarios, I would like to highlight two points. The first point is the ability to differentiate between the emergent scenarios from the non-emergent ones. Why is it so important in maxillofacial trauma? Because maxillofacial trauma is most of the, most of the time associated with frightening scenes then uh, we can make a mistake, a mistake and we think that, okay, we have an emergency. But with better clinical examination, we can rule out any emergency and we can schedule or design a definitive treatment. Since we have an emergency, the accuracy can be diminished. We have to act very fast and we don't pay attention to the details or the um, some um, aesthetic concepts. As you see in, in this case, a seven years old boy uh, who had been entrapped in the cabin on the lift. I mean, um, he had been entrapped between the floor of the cabin on the lift and the ceiling and had been involved with a severe maxillofacial trauma. As you see, he had a, um, a very bad and excessive laceration on the nose, on the cheek, on the lower lid uh, with the rupture of the lacrimal dog and a comminution, a severe comminution of nasal bone. Uh, with ZMC fractures and Lopert fractures, a comminuted panfacial fractures, better to say. At first sight, maybe we think that, okay, we have an emergency, but with better clinical examination, we found no emergency for the patient, so we can wait for a period of time, a very short period of time, in order to work out more precisely to schedule and design a definitive treatment. And after one week, we can reduce and fix all the fracture segments. And you can compare the pre and post operative CD scans of the patients, and you can see the result is so good, the perfect, and uh, the, um, the patient, and more specifically, more especially, the, their parents was so satisfied. The second point uh, is determining um, a priority between two or three emergencies in one patient. As you see in this 20 year old man who had been involved with multiple trauma due to MCA, motorcycle accident. At the arrival of this patient uh, to the emergency center of the Sina Hospital in Tehran, the hospital where I work, we have uh, such a clinical appearance from the patient, a very bad and excessive laceration on the forehead and supraorbital rim and upper lead. By better clinical examination, we found number one, comminution or comminuted fracture at forehead and supraorbital rim with the ZMC fractures and signs and symptoms that showed that the patient had intracranial injuries. I mean, that the uh, decreased consciousness with CSO leakage, rhinorrhea, the discharge of CSO through the nose. So, according the, uh, to this history, two groups of surgeons should be involved neurosurgeons and maxillofacial surgeons. But due to its, its con uh, the condition of this patient, the priority belonged to the neurosurgeons. Why? Because neurosurgeons needed to have more space, enough room in order to localize the rupture of the dura mater, in order to repair it, to prevent the future neurologic sepella. Although as a, as a maxillofacial surgeon, we prefer to keep all these fracture segments that I mentioned and marked some of them in left photo, we preferred to keep all of these fracture segments in order to prevent the future static sepella. But the priority belonged to the neurosurgeons. The priority belonged to the neurologic sepella. So the neurosurgeons removed all of the fracture segments from the forehead, localized the rupture of the dura mater, repair it, 
And two and a half months later on, the patient referred to us with such a clinical appearance. As you see, a very bad depression on the forehead and supraorbital ring with ketosis of the upper lip and the inferior and lateral displacement of the ZMC. So we need for this patient to design and schedule a three-stage operation. At first stage, we have to cover the defect of the forehead and supraorbital ring. As you see, with the, with the harvesting of the bone from the cranium, we cover the defect here at the forehead and supraorbital ring. Then we also osteotomize the ZMC in order to reposition it to the proper position and reconstruct or cover the defect at the orbital floor. And at the second stage, um, as a matter of fact, we did a refinement surgery. I mean, that with the use of the dermis fat graft, we covered all the irregularity at the forehead and the frontal and the supraorbital rim. And six months after these two operations, we had such results. Still, the patient needs the third stage. I mean, that the correction of the ptosis. But up to now, the result is so good. The defect at the forehead and supraorbital rim has been resolved. We have a very good position for the ZMC and the patient is satisfied. This is the classical and standard clinical feature of a patient with a gunshot injuries. As you see simultaneously, the patient has three emergencies. The first one, is the compromised airway. Why? Because the patient has a total and full destruction of the upper airway. Both nasopharynx and oropharynx have been disrupted. So we have no alternative, no choice than the trachostomy. Although we know that the trachostomy is associated with so many complications, but we have no choice in order to establish a patent airway. After uh, compromised airway, the patient had a severe hemorrhage. So we have to act very fast in order to control the bleeding. And um, we had a tissue loss. I mean that the evolved injury with a possibility, a high possibility of the future of the infection at the future. In this presentation, I would I don't want to explain about the procedure of the trachostomy. Just want to show in these two photos um, the exact location of the procedure. I mean that the insertion of the uh, incision and the insertion of the endotracheal tube and due to this location uh, tracheostomy. But as I mentioned before, um, with other fracture patterns we can have the compromised airway. The first one is the bilateral mandibular fracture. What is exactly the bilateral mandibular fracture? It means Bilateral mandibular condyle fracture, bilateral mandibular angle fracture, bilateral mandibular body, or bilateral mandibular parsimphelial fracture. The more anterior, the more compromised our way we have. What does happen in a bilateral mandibular fracture? According to this schematic photo, uh, you can see uh, two circumstances. The first one is the loss of anterior support for the tongue. I mean that when we have a mobile fracture segment at the anterior part, the tongue has lost its support anteriorly. And the second circumstance is the effect of the gravity on the tongue. So the tongue can collapse on the posterior wall of the oropharynx and block the airway. So in order to establish a patent airway, we have to schedule the operation or a definitive treatment as soon as possible in order to reduce and fix all the fracture segments to reestablish or rehabilitate the anterior support of the tongue and uh, or if it's not possible for us due to the systemic condition of the patient, uh, we have to apply other maneuvers in order to reposition or dis displace the tongue from the posterior wall of the orifice. So look at the patient. This patient had mandib bilateral mandibular condyle fracture. Previous to this current trauma, the patient had another trauma. Previously, the patient had symphysial fracture in which uh, he had a, an operation which rigid fixation of the symphysial fracture, but in this current trauma, the patient had bilateral mandibular condyle fracture. Look at the occlusion of the patients. As you see, the patient had become a retrogynosia. 
I mean that the posterior displacement of the mandible with simultaneously posterior displacement of the tongue and compromised airway. So we have to uh, schedule a definitive treatment in order to reposition the mandible anteriorly, reduce and fix all the fracture segments, establish the occlusion and establish a patent airway. Another patient, as you see, the patient had the bilateral mandibular subcondylar fracture with symphysial fracture. Look at the occlusion. In this case, we don't have the retrogonacea. In this case, we have the anterior open bite. Maybe we think that, okay, with anterior open bite, we don't have the posterior displacement of the mandible, so we don't have the compromised airway. But don't forget that in this type of fracture, bilateral mandibular fracture, we have the loss of the anterior uh, support of the tongue. So once again, we can have the um, compromised airway. So we have to design um, and schedule operation in order to reduce and fix all the fracture segments, reestablish and rehabilitate uh, the occlusion and establish the patent airway. Another patient, a comminuted one, a comminuted bilateral mandibular body fracture. But in this case, we have a multiple trauma. So it was not possible for us to schedule the operation a definitive treatment very soon. So we have to apply other maneuver in order to establish the patent error. For example, retracting the tongue by, with the stitch, with the aid of the stitch of the, at the tip of the tongue with, and with which we can retract the tongue anteriorly and fix it to the whatever, to the chin, to the neck, or to the cloth of the patient and establish the patent airway or the jaw thrust. I mean, that the bilaterally, we can apply a pressure digitally. I mean, that with, the, with, our, with our fingers at the mandibular angle, we can, we can push the mandible in a forward direction with which simultaneously the tongue can be pushed. Uh, another fracture pattern is uh, Lufford fractures. As you know, we have three levels of Lufford fractures. In Lufford one fracture, in which we have more um, commonly uh, a compromised airway, we have the separation of the magdala from the rest of the midface. In Lufford two fractures, we can have the pyramidal fracture. Or in Lufford three fractures, we have the separation of the whole midface from the cranial base. In Lufford fractures, we have the displacement of the magdala in an inferior and posterior direction. So the tongue in this type of fracture is not responsible for the compromised airway. In this type, the maxilla or the bone itself can block the airway. So the, there is no choice than operating the patient, scheduling, scheduling the a definitive treatment in order to reposition to the, uh, the maxilla to the anterior direction rehabilitate and regain the occlusion and um, establish a patent airway as we did for this patient. As you see on the left photo, we have the pseudo class three malocclusion due to lower bone fracture. And in the right photo, you can see after the heart treatment. Or uh, the comminuted panfacial fracture or the comminuted midfacial fracture. This patient had been referred to us with such a clinical appearance. As you see, the patient had a laceration which had been sutured in another center. As you look at the manner of the suturing more precisely, you can find out that the aesthetic, the concept of the aesthetic hadn't paid attention in this manner of suturing. Not because the surgeon was not skillful for this suturing, because the patient had an excessive, lac uh, excessive laceration with excessive hemorrhage. So uh, the surgeon needed to schedule an emergent treatment, not to paying attention to the aesthetic concept. So we have such a uh, suturing. And the patient had tracheostomy. It showed that the patient had compromised airway. Why? According to the CD scans of the patient that I put here in this slide, you can see we had a comminuted panfacial fracture. And when will the patient get rid of this tracheostomy? When we reduce uh, and fix all the fracture segments and we have a stable and fixed skeleton for him. In this, in this moment, you can um, disconnect and discharge uh, the tracheostomy. Um, 
As I mentioned before, uh, when we have the total destruction at the upper airway, I mean that when we have the destruction at nasopharynx and oropharynx, we have to use the tracheostomy in order to establish a patent airway. But sometimes we have a destructive nasopharynx, but oropharynx remains intact. In this manner, in this uh, condition under this circumstance, we can use the oral intubation in order to establish a patent airway. But when we have the maxillo mandibular or maxillofacial trauma, we need an oral cavity free from the endotracheal tube in order to have a very good access intraorally to the all the fracture segments. So we have to use uh, some alternative, an alternative called submental intubation in order to guide the endotracheal tube to the outside of the oral cavity. In submental intubation, we applied a very small incision at the paramedian area in submental crease skin in the anterior part and submental area. Then with blunt dissection, I mean that with the use of the hemostat, we uh, created a pathway from this incision through the soft tissues up to the floor of the mouth. Then we grasp the endotracheal tube and guide it to the outside of the oral cavity. So as you see at right photo, we have through supplemental intubation, we have a very good, a full exposure of the face without intervention by the endotracheal tube and without any complications associated with tracheostomy, the photo, uh, the left photo that I showed you before. The next emergency is excessive hemorrhage. I talked about the cause or the consequences of this emergency. And right now I wanna talk about very briefly about the management and the treatment of excessive hemorrhage. Fortunately, in maxillofacial trauma, in most of the time with packing, packing of the uh, origin of the uh, hemorrhage with or without suturing, we can control the bleeding, but sometimes we need to ligate the large feeding vessels, especially the uh, external carotid artery, even bilaterally. In some cases, we need bilaterally ligate the external carotid artery in order to control the bleeding. And if we have a delay on the transferring of the patient to the emergency center, sometimes we need to, to blood to um, um, order the blood transfusion, I mean, that the transfusion of the Paxil to the patient. And we have the avulsive injury. This patient is Shepard, uh, who had been involved with gunshot injuries. According to gunshot injuries, he had a comminuted fracture that's Bellamcy and Mandela. But in addition to these two types of Comminuted fractures, the patient had avulsive injury. I mean, that the loss of soft tissue with dehiscence, true and true dehiscence, especially in submandibular sub area and with uh, discharge of pus. So, under these conditions, it was not possible for us to reduce and fix the fracture segments. First of all, we have to manage and treat the soft tissues, I mean, that the avulsive injury. So, we have to, uh, first of all, we have to debride all the necrotic tissues. So it caused um, more and more tissue loss. Then we administer a, an appropriate antibiotic intravenously. And then with the use of the confield dressing, we accelerate uh, the uh, secondary intention of the tissue, secondary repair. Confield dressing is an organic dressing based on honey or wax. Who, uh, which can be exchanged every day. And after two months, as you see, we have such a good condition in the soft tissue of the patient. And right now we could uh, reduce and fix the fracture segment. It was not possible without comfort dressing to have such a good condition for the soft tissue during, the short, uh, during two months. It's so important for us. And we have the retrobal bar hemorrhage. Um, Retrobar bar hemorrhage means accumulation of blood at posterior compartment of the orbital cavity. It can occur primarily due to trauma or secondarily to our um, operation or iatrogenic. As you see in this case, in this young man, we have the iatrogenic 
preferable bar hemorrhage. Um, and in that, on the second day after our operation, we uh, found a retrobulbar bar hemorrhage for this patient. Uh, this patient uh, had a fracture at forehead, uh, ZMC, with a very huge defect on the orbital floor. So after our operation, which lasted eight hours, uh, on the second day, uh, the patient had uh, began to have some chief complaints. The first chief complaints was the pain and tenderness on the glove, which was progressive. We couldn't even palpate the glove or periorbital tissue. Gradually, the patient um, had the second chief complaint, which was the proptosis. You can see the proptosis of the patient, the overprojection over -projection of the glove. I mean that the dislocation of the glove outside of the orbital cavity in an anterior and inferior direction. Then the patient had, the, had uh, his Third chief complaint, it was diplopia, the blurred double vision. In this point, we confirmed our diagnosis as the retrobulbar hemorrhage, and we began to treat the retrobulbar hemorrhage with lateral cantotomy and canto, uh, cantolysis. If we couldn't diagnose, uh, we couldn't diagnose the retrobulbar hemorrhage, the patient would have had other chief complaints, such as the midriasis, I mean that the the uh, pupil dilation, and finally blindness, a permanent blindness. That's why we call the retrobulbar bar hemorrhage as a true emergency for the eye. So um, according to this schematic process and CT scan, this CT scan doesn't belong to the patient. Uh, you can um, see the exact location of the blood accumulated in the orbital cavity. Due to this accumulation, we have a pressure applied to the globe so we have the proptosis, I mean, that the hyperprojection of the globe. And we have the pressure which applied uh, to the oculomotor nerve or third cranial nerve. Then we have the midriasis. And to the optic nerve, the second cranial nerve, then we have the blindness. And for the management, we have to, lateral, we have to use the lateral cantotomy. Very, a very important point about the treatment of the uh, a retrobulbar hemorrhage is paying attention to the golden time. We have to pay attention to the golden time in order to prevent the permanent side effect or the permanent sequela. When we um, treat the patient less than two hours, or better to say less than 90 minutes, we can be sure that we have no sequela for the patient. Okay. In this um, type of treatment, we applied an incision at the lateral corner of the eye. And with this incision, I mean that it incised the two feet of the lateral uh, cantal tendon. And then with the mosquito, a very fine hemostat, we create a pathway. I mean that with the blunt dissection, we create a pathway from this incision up to the posterior compartment of the orbital cavity in order to evacuate or drain the, uh, the blood in order to remove the pressure from these three elements and to treat the patient. As you see, six months after our operation, we had such a result. As you see, the depression of forehead has been resolved completely. We have a very good and proper position for the ZMC, and the patient doesn't have any ophthalmologic complications, no diplopia, no anophthalmos, no blindness. And finally, we have two um, other associated um, emergency. The first one is due to intracranial injuries. When we have the fracture at the cranial base, a, um, a pathway has been created for the air in order to enter to the intracranial space. Look at the photos, uh, look at the upper CD scans. You can see the black, sh black shadows on the intracranial space. This um, paraclinical view is a Fuji mountain, like a Fuji mountain in Japan, is the accumulation of the air or nomocephalus in the intracranial space, which can apply a pressure on the, um, on the cerebral tissue, which is life-threatening. And then through this pathway in the crane, at the cranial base, the, the CSF can pass through, the, uh, through this pathway outside to the intracranial space. I mean that we have a CSF leakage. Look at the lower CT scan. You can see the accumulation of the CSF in the maxillary sinus 
due to the fracture at cripiform plate, I mean that the uh, through the ethmoidal air cell, when we have the anterior cranial base fracture, we have the accumulation of CSF at the maxillary sinus. This application can have two manifestations, two diagnostic manifestations. The first one is CSF leakage through the nose or rhinorrhea or through the air or otorrhea. CSF leakage and nomocephalus are both life threatening and a true emergency. And intrathoracic injury. Due to intrathoracic injuries, the v, maybe we have the refracture. Or no, without refractor, maybe we have only a blunt chest trauma, but an excessive blunt chest trauma. When we have the blood, um, we have a, a when we have the refractor, we have the blood accumulated in the pleural cavity, and when we have the blunt chest trauma, the air can be accumulated in the pleural cavity. When we have the air accumulation, we have the pneumotrax, and when we have the blood accumulation, we have the hemotrux. Pneumotrux or hemotrux can apply the pressure on the lung, which we have the collapse of the lung and progressive dyspnea. I mean that the problem in breathing, which was life, which is life threatening. So we have to remove the pressure from the lung. So we have to create a pathway in order to evacuate or drain the blood or air from the pleural cavity with the use of the chest tube. Thank you very much for your consideration. If you have any question, I'm at your service at the end of the panel. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Mumeni. It was very interesting and useful as always. Uh, Thank you. I don't see any questions in the chat box. So I would personally like to ask you a few questions uh, if it's okay with you. Could you please tell us, in a patient with a cranial base fracture and panfacial fracture, what is your preferred way of intubation? Um, my preference is submental intubation because I don't I don't like the tracheostomy. Tracheostomy is all the time associated with so many complications. But when we have the um, uh, when we can use the oral intubation we can add a supplemental uh, alternative in order to have the full exposure of the, the total space without any complications associated with the tracheostomy. Mean, I prefer uh, supplemental intubation and um, since uh, five or six years um, up to now, I use it without any complications. Yeah. And don't patients have any problem with the score? No, up to now, no. Yeah, okay. And I think there's one more question for you. In a patient with, in a, in a multiple trauma patient with concomitant trauma to intracranial, intrathoracic, and also uh, uh, intra, intracranial, intrathoracic compartment, and also with the retrobulbar hemorrhage, which one do you consider more emergent? Um, in my speciality, retrobulbar hemorrhage is very important. But first of all, we have to uh, determine the exact type of intracranial injury and intrathoracic injury. Sometimes the patient has an intrathoracic injury, but not in an emergency, not belong to the emergency. And as I mentioned at the beginning of my presentation, it, it's so important to differentiate between the emergency and non-emergency. If we have the emergency in these three sites, we can um, act simultaneously. The neurosurgeons can work on the intracranial space. The, um, uh, the surgeons, the thoracic surgeons can act on the thorax and I can act on the globe. But it's, uh, it's very important and not to um, have a panic when we hear an intracranial injury or intrathoracic injury. It's, so important to determine the, the, exactly if we have emergency or not. Yeah, thank you very much. No. And I, I totally support the team approach, people <laughs> working simultaneously. Yeah, right. Thank you very much. Dr. No. Dennis, I think there are a few questions from yes. Dr. Volkan as well. Thank you very much, uh, Doctor, for your uh, valuable uh, information and sharing us uh, your uh, valuable experiences with us. Uh, it was very informative uh, uh, and very uh, nice team job uh, also. Thank you. Thank you.
Thank you very uh, much. Uh, Dr. Uh, 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 Wolken, uh, can you please share us? Uh, you have uh, uh, very uh, uh, nice uh, presentations. Thank you very much also to you. Uh, and uh, you have uh, uh, asked uh, two questions at the beginning of the panel. Uh, can you please uh, summarize uh, uh, your questions and uh, maybe we can uh, be informed uh, about how uh, we can uh, manage uh, the uh, basic uh, abscess uh, drainage? Uh, can you please summarize us uh, how we can uh, be uh, manage uh, drainage? Uh, and how we can decide uh, which abscess should be uh, drainage uh, at the time we see the patient or should we wait uh, in some uh, cases? So uh, we have to make a, a surgical treatment if uh, there is an uh, space abscess in the presence of a space abscess. So first of all, in order to make a drainage, uh, the patient should be uh, in antibiotic therapy. So uh, we prefer to make the drainage in the abscess phase. However, uh, if the uh, abscess is in the cellulite phase and uh, the patient has a uh, risk of uh, a faster progression of the infection, so we can also do it in the cellulite phase uh, in order to uh, not uh, get uh, the other spaces involved in the infection. So uh, the basis is we uh, want to prevent uh, from uh, primary spaces, uh, infections of the primary spaces turning out uh, to be infections of the secondary spaces like uh, submet submasoteric spaces, Tergomandibular spaces or uh, pharyngeal spaces. So, in order to prevent that, uh, as I said, it would be uh, better even uh, if we do not have a drainage, also uh, we can make an incision and put a drain uh, in order to prevent the progression of the infection. Okay, okay, thank you very much, doctor. You are welcome, thank you. Uh, there, uh, is there any other questions from the uh, participants or any uh, contributions related with, with our speakers' uh, presentations? I think uh, we don't see uh, questions in the chat box. Uh, okay, let's then move to the uh, periodontology panel. Uh, and uh, I'd like to introduce Dr. Uh, Ebro Özkan from uh, Istanbul Yeditepe University. Uh, and uh, I'd like to introduce uh, her uh, before uh, her presentation. Uh, 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 Assistant Professor uh, Ebru Özkan Karaca holds her degree in dentistry at the Istanbul University in 1998. Uh, she later earned a doctoral degree in periodontology, Yeditepe Dental University, Istanbul and European Federation of Periodontology, uh, and uh, specialization uh, diploma in periodontology and implant dentistry. She has been working in Yeditepe University Periodontology Department since 2010. Uh, and here's the stage, Dr. Ebru Özkan. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'm very happy uh, to have had the opportunity to, my to present my lecture, this joint lecture. Today, I will talk about the evaluation and the management of periodontal emergencies, which is in periodontal and gingival abscess and pericoronitis, acute physical and chemical and term thermal injuries. Here you will see, you can find the correct, uh, some answers, uh, some questions um, that you can answer after this lecture. According to the American 
Academy of Periodontology, the acute periodontal disease are rapid onset. Uh, the clinical conditions that involve the periodontium and associated structures and may be characterized by pain and discomfort, tissue destruction, and infection. Among these conditions, the following diseases have been uh, listed. The gingival abscess, periodontal abscess, pericoronitis, and acute physical chemical thermal injuries, and necrotizing periodontal, uh, periodontal diseases, herpetic gingivitis, pericoronal abscess, and combined endoperiolations. Today, I will talk about uh, I will not talk about the, the herpetic gingivitis, the periodontal disease and combined lesions, and uh, they will, uh, this will uh, not include in the present lecture, whereas so-called gingival and periodontal abscesses were considered within the category of named abscess in periodontium. Abscess in the periodontium are the one of the main reasons the patients to seek the emergency care in the dental clinic. These abscesses are the caused by the broad group of acute condi infections that may originate from the tooth or the periodontium. Different criteria have been used to classify these abscesses. According to the collocation of the abscess, a classification was proposed by Mank by gingival abscess, periodontal abscess, and pericardial abscess. And depending on the origin of the acute infections process, the two, two types of abscess may occur. First one is the periodontitis related abscess, which is that the acute infection originates from the bacteria present at the subgingival biofilm in the deepened periodontal pocket, or non periodontitis related abscess, the acute infection originates from the bacteria coming from another local source, such as foreign body infection. The proposal of classification for odontal abscess based on the etiological factors by published in 2018 by Herrera and co-workers after the 2017 World Workshop of Periodontology, which is, is uh, the new classification as depends on the periodontal abscess in periodontal patients and the non-periodontitis patients. You can see this um, uh, in the, you can see the Table that acute exacerbation and after treatment uh, periodontal uh, abscess can be related to these symptoms, and also some gingival abscess or non periodontal periodontal patients can be a, uh, the source will be infection, harmful habits, or orthodontic uh, factors, gingival overgrowth, and alteration of the root surface. In a periodontitis patient, a periodontal abscess represents a period of active tissue breakdown and it is a result of the acute exacerbation of a chronic infection residing in the periodontal tissues. The abscess formation is usually due to the marginal occlusion of a deep periodontal pocket that prevents proper drainage. And the existence of deep and uh, pockets and the deep concavities associated with the procation lesions uh, favors the development of these acute conditions. Acute anti-inflammatory process is characterized by the local accumulation of neutrophils, remnants of the tissue breakdown, and the pus formation. If this pus for retention is not drained from the pocket, the destructive process may progress rapidly. Different pathogenic mechanisms can lead to abscess formation in the periodontium. Uh, such abscess may develop in a deepened periodontal pocket without any ob obvious external influence, and uh, this exacerbation can as, a, as an untreated periodontal patients or as a recurrent infection during the support of periodontal therapy. The post-related abscess um, can be a post uh, can be after post-scaling periodontal uh, abscess or post-surgical periodontal abscess or post-antibiotic periodontal abscess. In the post-scaling periodontal abscess, usually it occurs immediately after the scaling and uh, routine professional prophylaxis, and they are usually related to the, the presence of the small fragments or re removing remaining calculus that obstruct the pocket entrance. And after the surgery, after periodontal surgeries, uh, it is often the result of the incomplete removal of subgingival calculus or the presence of foreign bodies or in the periodontal tissues, such as 
some sutures or regenerative devices or the pieces of periodontal pad. Uh, sometimes uh, when we prescribed antibiotics, uh, this systemic antibiotics without appropriate subgingival debridement in the patients with advanced periodontitis may cause abscess formation. When we look at the oral symptoms of the, this periodontal abscess, the most common symptom is pain. And other symptoms include swelling, deep to red discoloration of the tissue, tooth sensitive to pressure, tooth mobility, the tooth feels high to the patient, and the tooth may become slightly extruded as a result of the swelling of the periodontal ligaments. And the treatment of the periodontal abscess should include two distinct phases. First of all, we should manage the acute lesion, and then we could manage the pre-existing or residual lesion, especially in the patients with the periodontitis. In the treatment, we should control the acute condition. And in this condition, four therapeutic alternatives have been proposed. First of all, tooth extraction and drainage and the debridement, use of different locally or systemically administered antibiotics, and periodontal surgery could be an option. The most logical treatment of the periodontal abscess, is the, uh, in, as in the other abscess in the body, should include drainage. And compression and debridement of the soft tissue wall and application of antiseptics after drainage. If the abscess is associated with the foreign body impaction, the object must be eliminated through careful debridement, although it may no longer present. When we use the antibiotics in the acute phase, systemic antimicrobials should be used as a sole treatment, uh, can be used as a sole treatment, as initial treatment or adjunctive treatment to drainage. Systemic antibiotics as a sole or as in the treatment may only be recommended if there is a need for pre-medication and if the infection is not well localized or if adequate drainage cannot be achieved. As an adjunctive treatment, systemic antimicrobials should be considered if is a, is a clear systemic involvement is present. After drainage and the arrival of the patient, uh, the patient should re be recalled to, after 24 to 48 hours after the treatment to evaluate the resolution of the abscess and the duration of the intake of the antimicrobials. Once the acute phase is resolved, has resolved, and the patient should be scheduled for a follow-up therapeutic phase. And what is the duration of the antibacterials and which type of antibiotics we will use after, during the treatment? The duration and the type of the antibiotic is a matter of question including the recommendation of short causes of the therapy. In summary, uh, and the Numerous treatment protocols have been proposed, but the scientific evidence is not available to recommend a definite approach. The drug is the most appropriate profile is the metronidazole, azithromycin, and the amoxicillin plus covalent, and have been shown good clinical results with these antibiotics. And the duration of the therapy should be restricted to the duration of the acute lesion, which is normally two to three days. When we call, uh, come to the surgery, the surgeries have been proposed mainly for the abscess associated with the deep vertical defects, or in cases occurring after periodontal debridement in which a residual calculus is present in subgingivally. A case survey is evaluating a com uh, combination of an access flap with deep scaling and integration with doxycycline is uh, available in the literature, but uh, the report says good result but the scientific data not, were not provided. Management of the pre-existent or residual lesion, normally the most prolapses occur in the pre-existent periodontal pocket and periodontal therapy should be evaluated after the resolution of the acute phase. In cases where the patient has, has, not, has not been treated previously and the appropriate periodontal treatment should be provided. If the patient is already within the active phase of therapy and the periodontal therapy should complete it once the acute lesion has been treated, and uh, in patients receiving supportive therapy, careful evaluation should be made after the acute lesion. 
A gingival abscess is a localized present infection that involves the marginal gingiva or interdental papilla. Following a traumatic insult of a fish bone, for example, fish bone, brush bristle, implantation of virulent bacteria into the gingival connective tissue leads to excessive gingival reaction, inflammatory reaction. The diagnosis of the gingival abscess is a based on the symptoms revealed by the patient and the signs of the ruling summation. Additional informa information can be obtained through the medical and dental history and the radiographic examination. Gingival abscess is confined to the marginal tissues and often presents a non disease size. Finding and the retrieval of the opening of frame material often diagnostic. And the diagnosis of the gingival abscess can be made based on the history of one to two days of a pain and a localized gingival swelling of marginal gingiva. And we'll look at the treatment of gingival abscess uh, and the, uh, the progression of the abscess. And first, it is early stage, it appears as a reddish colored mass with a smooth shiny surface. And however, within the 40, uh, for, uh, for the eight hour, it becomes pointed and flattened, and with a surface surface from the prudent exudate and may may express. And the adjacent teeth may be symptomatic or to, to persecution. If left alone, gingival abscess usually ruptures spontaneously. So after these uh, stages, the flinting area of the lesion should be widened to permit the drainage. The area should be cleansed with warm water. After that, the lesion is generally reduced in size and free of symptoms after 40, uh, 24 hours. And if the residual size of lesion is too great, it should be removed surgically. The term pericoronitis refers to the inflammation of the gingiva in relation to the crown of the incomplete erupted tooth. It occurs most often in the mandibular molar area and it can be acute, subacute, or chronic. The partially <coughs> erupted or impacted mandibular third molar is the most common sign of uh, pericoronitis. And the space between the crown of the tooth and the overlying gingival flap is an ideal area for the accumulation of food debris and the bacterial growth. Even in patients with no clinical signs or symptoms, the gingival flap is often chronically inflamed and infected, and it has varying degrees of ulceration along its inner surface. A good inflammatory involvement is a constant possibility, and it may be exacerbated by trauma, occlusion, or a foreign body under t underneath the tissue flap. <coughs> Acute pericoronitis is defined by varying degrees of inflammatory involvement of pericoronal flap and adjacent structures, as well as by systemic uh, complications. The resultant clinical picture is red, swollen, separating lesion that is ex uh, exclusively tender uh, and the radiating pains to ear, throat, and the floor of the mouth. And the patient is extremely uncomfortable as a result of pain, a full taste, and an inability to close the jaws. And swelling of the check in the region of the angle of the jaw and the lymphadenitis are coming findings. And sometimes trismus may be presenting complaint. And you look at the treatment of pericoronitis, uh, depends of the severity, should be, it depends on the severity of inflammation and the admissibility of the retaining involved tooth. All pericoronal flaps should be viewed with a suspicion and the persistent uh, symptom-free coronal flaps should be removed as a preventive measure against the subsequent acute involvement. The treatment of acute pericoronitis consists of gently flushing the area with warm water to remove debris and exudate and swabbing with antiseptic after relating the flap gently from the tooth with a scaler. The area is flushed with warm water. The occlusion is related to determine if an opposing tooth is occluding with the pericoronal flap and it, it may be necessary to reduce the soft tissue surgery and or to adjust the opening, uh, opposing tooth to elevate pain. 
Antibiotics can be prescribed in severe cases and for patients who may have clinical evidence of disuse microbial infiltration of the tissue. After the acute phase in the pericoronitis, the prognosis of the tooth should be evaluated carefully. And the bone loss on the distal surface of the second molar is a concern when the third molar are impacted along the distal surface. To reduce the risk of the bone loss around second molars and partially or completely impacted third molar should be extract, uh, extracted in early in their development. If the decision is made to retain the tooth, then the pericardial flap is surgically reduced. It is necessary to remove the tissue distal to tooth as well as the flap on the occlusal surface. Incising only the colonial portion of the flap leaves the deep distal pocket which invites the recurrence of acute period of uh, pericoronal involvement. The acute physical, cavical, and thermal injuries of the uh, mouth uh, is a common clinical practice, again, of the dentistry. Such injuries can result from accidental tooth bites, hard food, sharp aids of the teeth, hot food, or excessive tooth brushing. Some injuries can mostly be caused by iatrogenic damage during the dental treatment or other procedures related to the oral cavity. The clinical presentation of the lesions associated with the physical or in chemical agents will depend on the, whether the action of the agent is a direct or indirect. Such lesions impair patients' normal oral function and can cause pain in patients eating, chewing, and talking. The clinical presentation of the lesions associated with the physical and chemical uh, agents after receiving the diagnosis, treatment can be provided if the causative factor is removed. Among the traumatic lesions, the atrogenic lesions are the relevant in dentistry because they are produced during the therapeutic implantation or result of the therapy. The when you look at the physical injuries in the oral uh, mucosa, the eosinophilic ulcer of the oral mucosa is an uncommon being ulcer seen in the middle age to elderly, uh, elderly adults that appears suddenly in the mouth or in the lips, is usually painful and heals over a few weeks. And the eosinophils are a type of inflammatory cell with characteristic appearance under the microscope. And the biopsy is usually required to confirm the diagnosis and exclude other conditions such as after incest and mostly, yeah, most importantly, oral cancer. The eosinophilic ulcer of the oral mucosa usually heals by itself within a one mouth, but there no specific treatment is required. Rapid healing is typically, typically seen after a biopsy. And the congenital insensitivity to pain is defined as the persistent occurrence of infections and inexplicable uh, fever and uh, anhydrosis and inability to sweat and the lack of response to deleterious the stimuli such as uh, uh, mutating performance and mental abnormalities and the injuries oral cavity. Unfortunately, these uh, Symptoms can also uh, only be managed by uh, symptomatic uh, treatment and uh, to prevent trauma from sharp aids of the teeth. The delineal is also a horizontal strike on the buccal mucosa at the level of the occlusal plane, extending from the commissure to the uh, posterior teeth. It's more prominent in the individuals with reduced overjet of the posterior teeth, and no treatment is required. With, and the white streak may disappear spontaneously in, the, in some people. But very sharp age, teeth should be removed, corrected. And the lesions made uh, by the chronic bite trauma and nibbling on the buccal mucosa generally cause keratinized uh, sh uh, shreds, uh, tissue tags, or erosinavir on the scomative surface. Parafunctional bite of the buccal mucosa, lips, and the tongue until wear of the superficial epithelium and wound formation is constantly made by those patients. Regafeta disease or syndrome is a rare condition of the infants characterized by ulceration on the ventral surface of the tongue or in the inner surface of the lip. 
Uh, it's caused uh, by trauma of the soft tissue from the erupted baby teeth, and it can be spread as a subgingival traumatic ulceration. Then we come to the chemical uh, injuries. The caustic chemical and the direct materials, when they come in contact with the mucosa, are often very irritating and cause mucosal trauma. And Inappropriate usage of medical, uh, medi medication, medications and such as aspirin and application on the neighboring mucosa of painful teeth with decay may result in mucosal uh, trauma. Iatrogenically, during the dental treatment, irrigant solutions such as uh, sodium hypochloride or formalin or some endodontic pastas with arsenic can irritate the mucosa. However, such injuries are not very common since the introduction of rubber dam in dental practice. When we look at the terminal injuries, uh, the hot, cold, and electrical trauma uh, are very uncommon, but although burns caused by very hot food and drinks may need emergency consultation. The patient will uh, feel pain in the affected area, which appears with the irritable and discriminated sometimes with the vessels, erysis, and illness, and normally the diagnosis is straightforward. Damage the periodontal tissue as a result of thermal injury sometimes causes severe a gingival recession. And thank you for listening. Thank you very much, Dr. Askan. It was very informative and useful. And I think we will save the question for the end of the lecture. Okay, if thank you, you very much. Thank you very much. Okay, our next lecture is Dr. Negar Kanuni Sabet. She's a periodontist. She's currently working in the Department of Periodontology in Tehran University of Medical Sciences. She got her general dentistry degree in 2015 from Hamadan University of Medical Sciences and then she got her periodontic specialty in 2018 from Isfahan University of Medical Sciences. Dr. Kanuni, if you're ready, you're all ears. So Dr. Kanuni, are you there? Dr. Kanuni, can you hear me? I think you can start your lecture, Dr. Kanuni. We can hear you. Okay. Can you hear my voice? Um, yes. yes. Yes, we can hear you clearly. Yeah. Okay. Thank you so much. Uh, so, uh, do you have my screen too? And we can also see your screen. But I think there's something wrong with the voice. It's not as clear as before. Okay. Uh, it's my yeah, sound. better now. Okay. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Doctor. Uh, uh, dear Doctor, uh, uh, I'm Doctor Kanuni Sabe, and uh, we are uh, going to talk about periodontal emergencies uh, in terms of evaluation and uh, treatment. Uh, as you can see, uh, uh, we have uh, two. We designed uh, two uh, multi-choice questions uh, from this part. And uh, we are uh, expected uh, that uh, dear students can uh, answer these questions at the end of this part. 
Uh, okay, as you uh, know, uh, periodontal emergencies uh, uh, arises when an acute condition uh, involving periodontal uh, attachment apparatus uh, uh, cause uh, destruction and pain and forcing the patient to seek urgent care. And uh, so diagnosing and managing these periodontal emergencies are a common part of a general dental practice. Uh, in this section, we are going to summarize and uh, discuss uh, the presentation, etiology, and management of uh, three key periodontal uh, emergencies, uh, including endoperial lesion or abscess, uh, necrotizing periodontal diseases, and subgingival uh, tooth uh, fracture. Okay. Uh, we start with uh, necrotizing periodontal diseases. Uh, as you know, necrotizing periodontal diseases are uh, considered uh, the most uh, severe inflammatory uh, condition and lesion in oral cavity that are associated uh, with uh, dental plaque and dental biofilm. Uh, necrotizing periodontal disease uh, usually have uh, two subcategories. Uh, based on the uh, tissues uh, involved in this destruction, necrotizing uh, gingivitis and necrotizing periodontitis. Uh, necrotizing gingivitis describe a scenario when only gingival tissue affected. Uh, in contrast, uh, in necrotizing periodontitis, the necrosis uh, progresses to uh, alveolar bone to uh, periodontal ligament and so leading to uh, attachment loss. Uh, so uh, uh, there are uh, two uh, aspects of uh, bone disease and it has been suggested that these conditions may be different stages of the same disease. Uh, let's uh, take a look at uh, the NPDs or necrotizing periodontal uh, disease uh, clinical uh, presentation. As you can see in this uh, photography view, uh, the most uh, affected site uh, is usually the mandibular anterior teeth. Uh, as you can see again, uh, we have uh, necroti necrotizing and uh, ulcerative lesions in uh, the gingiva. Uh, usually, uh, the disease uh, begins uh, initially from interdental papilla and then it progresses to gingival margin. And you can uh, see also the uh, uh, clear and obvious uh, uh, linear erythema around the affected areas. Uh, this is an important uh, point that we remember uh, the uh, hallmark. Uh, uh, clinical presentation of uh, necrotizing periodontal disease that is the punched out uh, status of uh, interdental papilla. Uh, in the necrotizing periodontitis, uh, while uh, we have a destructive process in a, a bone uh, surrounding the affected tooth, uh, we can uh, see uh, also uh, uh, necrotic bone fragments uh, named secus, and uh, uh, they can uh, see uh, in uh, severe cases. Uh, other less common symptoms may include uh, halitosis, fever, and malaise. Uh, we can also see uh, usually a grain soda membrane in affected areas, and if you remove gently the soda membrane, you can uh, see the underlying connective tissue become exposed and bleed. So uh, let's uh, discuss uh, the etiology of uh, these necrotizing periodontal diseases. Uh, these uh, NPD is usually caused by infectious uh, commensal uh, microorganisms uh, like uh, pozo, uh, fusiform bacteria, and uh, cirrocates, these organisms. Uh, is uh, usually commensal, uh, but have the capacity to uh, invade the epithelium and underlying connective tissue, so release their endotoxin and cause periodontal tissue destruction uh, if uh, some uh, condition uh, like uh, immunosuppressive uh, condition present. Uh, you know that in patients with necrotizing periodontal disease, uh, usually, uh, there may be uh, as uh, associated risk factors such as uh, high level of stress, 
heavy smoking and uh, poor, uh, poor nutrition, severe malnutrition, and also uh, some uh, related systemic diseases uh, or uh, medication use uh, that uh, can cause uh, immuno uh, uh, deficiency and immunosuppression in uh, involved patients. Uh, so uh, usually both uh, necrotizing gingivitis and necrotizing periodontitis associated with uh, an untreated uh, AIDS or uh, HIV or uh, some other uh, uh, systemic conditions uh, such as chemotherapy, radiotherapy, or uh, some uh, kind of specific medications such as uh, anti-rejection uh, drugs in transplant patients. In this patient, we have immunosuppressive uh, condition, and this uh, uh, mentioned uh, organism can cause uh, bone and uh, gingiva destruction. So, what should we do in these cases? Uh, we usually uh, divide uh, the management and the treatment uh, of uh, this uh, the condition, the severe, of course, condition, into two phases. Uh, phase one is the um, uh, emergency fire phase or uh, emergency management of uh, the necrotizing periodontal disease. Uh, at the first uh, step, uh, we should uh, gently and superficially uh, debride uh, the site uh, to remove soft and uh, mineralized deposits, but uh, very carefully and gently. Uh, next uh, step is, is to uh, 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 instruct our patient uh, and uh, the method of oral hygiene uh, that uh, cause a little pain and uh, to uh, avoid the pain and ensure healing uh, for patient. Uh, the patient is uh, better to advise, to be advised to use uh, antimicrobial uh, and chemical blood control agents such as polyhexidine uh, or uh, hydrogen peroxide. And of course, uh, especially in patients uh, with uh, uh, systemic uh, manifestations uh, such as lymphadenopathy, lymphadenopathy, uh, we can uh, prescribe the anti systemic antibiotics such as metronidazole, uh, and uh, is usually uh, the first choice because of its uh, action against an aerobe bacteria. This is the emergency phase uh, when uh, we have completed this phase and uh, the uh, uh, sign and symptoms of patient uh, slightly uh, revealed uh, and uh, we see the improvement. Uh, we should monitor the patient closely. We should support these patients. Uh, and uh, then uh, if uh, the sign and symptoms improve, uh, we can complete uh, the uh, uh, supra and subgingival uh, debridement. We should reinforce uh, the strict oral hygiene measures, and we should uh, we must be sure that our patient can uh, uh, can keep uh, a good uh, oral hygiene uh, in the entire uh, time. Uh, uh, after uh, these phases, uh, we uh, go to the next step that we should treat uh, all the uh, peri persisting periodontal uh, disease and deficiency, and of course, control the systemic risk factor that uh, cause and uh, um, uh, cause uh, this condition. Uh, and uh, after uh, these steps, uh, if uh, we have any asymmetry in the gingival tissues. Uh, any destruction, any uh, bone, uh, any, any severe bone destruction, uh, we should uh, consider regenerative therapies uh, to restore uh, the gingival and bone uh, art architecture in its normal status. Uh, our second um, our second section is uh, going to be a subgingival root fracture. Uh, as a clinical, about its uh, clinical presentation, fracture teeth are usually uh, associated with uh, localized deep socket around involved teeth and uh, possibly in some cases, uh, a periodontal or apical abscess can be seen also. Uh, usually the teeth and the patient have an extremely pain and uh, tenderness percussion uh, at the uh, involved uh, teeth uh, and uh, maybe, uh, of course, steel 
she had pain when uh, she uh, or he bite something on the uh, involved. Uh, the etiology is uh, most of the time uh, a patient uh, that uh, have a trauma injury during chewing or a patient that have uh, some teeth, uh, uh, heavy duty store teeth uh, without possible coverage and have some perfunctional habits like bruxis. Bruxis is a really a key risk factor uh, for this kind of fractures. Uh, another etiology factor can consider the patients uh, that have a, a, a dental system uh, with a reduced periodontium. This reduced periodontium lead to an unfavorable, unfavorable uh, crown to root ratio, and so uh, a, a, a trauma, trauma can uh, cause a fracture of a patient's teeth. Okay, uh, what should we do in these uh, uh, cases? Uh, again, uh, we have a two uh, phase of treatment. Uh, phase uh, one is uh, the emergency phase, and uh, we should uh, decide uh, on uh, uh, maintain or extraction of teeth uh, uh, depend on, uh, on and based on the vitality of the tooth as well as the location and the extent of the fracture. Uh, first of all, we should uh, relieve acute pain by, remo by removal of the fracture part. And of course, uh, we, can, we should uh, drain uh, the uh, abscess if uh, there is an existing abscess. In the, in the late uh, phases, uh, we should uh, complete our treatment if uh, the uh, teeth uh, is uh, uh, maintainable and restorable, uh, we can uh, uh, perform endodontic treatment. Uh, but if uh, the, the mentioned teeth in both teeth uh, is uh, untreatable and unrestorable, it should be extracted and uh, then replaced by a, a dental implant. Dental implant uh, is usually the best choice uh, in these cases when the teeth is uh, untreatable, as we see in this photo. Uh, but uh, if the teeth is uh, treatable, as we said, uh, we perform the endodontic treatment. Uh, and uh, considering uh, and regarding uh, the location and extent of the fracture line, uh, we should uh, restore uh, uh, the crown of the teeth. Uh, to restoring, to proper restoring uh, the involved uh, teeth, we should have uh, an intact and a sound a structure of teeth. So uh, we have uh, two uh, different uh, treatment modalities uh, in these cases. Uh, we can uh, use the surgical crown lengthening um, and to restore uh, and uh, uh, restore the uh, uh, intact and uh, sound uh, uh, structure of invasives uh, for uh, restoring, uh, for proper restoring uh, the teeth. Uh, in some cases, especially uh, in uh, cases that uh, have uh, high uh, demands of aesthetics and in the zone of aesthetic, as uh, you see in the uh, lower picture. Uh, we should uh, have sometimes uh, uh, use uh, forced tooth eruption technique, uh, and uh, of course, it is uh, more time consuming than uh, surgical crown lengthening. But in some cases, uh, aesthetic is uh, very important, and uh, we should consider the, the, the aesthetic the status uh, of the teeth and the, 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 state, the aesthetic demands of the patient. So in some cases, uh, we can't uh, use surgical crown lengthening, and we should use uh, forced tooth eruption to achieve uh, the best uh, aesthetic uh, results uh, in final restoration. Uh, and uh, now uh, we come to our uh, last uh, part uh, of uh, this uh, uh, section, that is uh, about the endoperial lesions or abscess. Uh, you know that uh, persistent infection, the pulp, 
that tissues uh, can lead to secondary infection of breakdown of the periodontal uh, attachment of her tooth. And uh, conversely, the uh, severe periodontal disease may initiate or exacerbate uh, the inflammation uh, and the uh, inflammation changes in the pal tissue of the teeth. There are uh, three main pathways that, uh, that uh, connect uh, uh, connect uh, part to periodontium, uh, that is uh, apical foraminal, lateral or accessory funnels, uh, and the uh, dentinal tubules. Uh, and the uh, apical foraminal is uh, the main uh, uh, pathway between these uh, three kind of uh, pathways. Okay. And let's uh, take a look at the uh, clinical presentation of uh, endoperial lesions. Endoperial lesion uh, can uh, subcategorize in uh, two, three. Uh, first, uh, periodontal, primary endodontal uh, with uh, secondary periodontal involvement. Second, uh, uh, primary periodontal with secondary endodontal uh, involvement lesions. And the third, uh, true combined endoperial lesions. Uh, based on the uh, uh, nature of the uh, disease and the origin uh, of the destruction and the uh, infection, uh, we can have a different uh, kind of uh, clinical manifestation. Uh, the patient may have a severe uh, and uh, well localized pain uh, in uh, uh, mentioned size. Uh, vitality pulse test uh, usually is negative, but uh, it uh, depends on the origin uh, of the infection. We can also uh, generalize bone loss uh, or a narrow pocket depth uh, at the infected uh, teeth. Uh, but uh, we should uh, keep in mind that uh, it uh, usually happens in uh, primary periodontal and secondary endodontal uh, involvement lesion. Uh, we can also have uh, abscess formation uh, that is associated uh, with uh, uh, deep uh, probing pocket depth uh, surrounding a non vital tooth. And uh, it's uh, um, a dump shape, uh, a smooth, uh, shiny swelling of the gingiva and mucosa that uh, can uh, cause a severe pain and discomfort for the patient uh, and is tender in uh, palpation and percussion. Uh, as you can see, uh, we have these uh, three subcategory of uh, endoperial lesions uh, in this slide. Uh, uh, these, uh, as we said, uh, we have a uh, primary endodontic uh, with secondary periodontal involvement lesion, as you can see in the left side, uh, that uh, it's named also retrograde periodontitis. As you can see, uh, the origin of the lesion is a uh, uh, pulse tissue. We have uh, an extensive uh, carry lesion or uh, a uh, huge uh, or extensive uh, old restoration. Uh, and if uh, this uh, condition left untreated, uh, can uh, progress uh, uh, atypically or uh, from uh, lateral or accessory canals and affect the uh, periodontal tissues. And so we can uh, have a primary endodontic with secondary periodontal involvement. Uh, next uh, category, subcategory is uh, the primary periodontal with uh, secondary endodontic uh, involvement lesion. In this um, uh, category, uh, the origin of the uh, effect uh, is uh, uh, background uh, and uh, existing periodontal disease. Uh, as you can see in a uh, radiographic view, we have a generalized bone loss in uh, uh, other sites uh, than uh, involve the teeth, but uh, as uh, we uh, mentioned the teeth and involved teeth, uh, the destruction is more severe uh, and very extensive. Uh, and uh, because uh, it, the destruction uh, of periodontal disease uh, reach uh, the foramen uh, apical, uh, it can affect 
affect the pulp tissue and uh, so it uh, cause uh, inflammation in uh, pulp tissue and uh, resulting pulpitis. Uh, and the last uh, category in this uh, uh, lesions is the true combined endothelial lesions. Uh, as you can see, we have a both uh, uh, endodontic and periodontal lesion at the same time. Uh, we have a, a tooth uh, with uh, 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 untreated uh, uh, existing uh, carry lesion and of course uh, uh, an existing uh, periodontal lesion that left untreated. Uh, so uh, they uh, progress uh, chronally and atypically and they reach together and cause a severe destruction at the mentioned teeth. Uh, if, we can, if we want to summarize uh, the clinical uh, and radiographic manifestation of a dissolution, uh, we can uh, say uh, that in primary endodontic lesion with secondary periodontal involvement, the origin of the lesion is pulp. Uh, it's uh, really important uh, to keep in mind that uh, know the origin of the uh, defect and lesion is very important because uh, it, uh, uh, it can determine uh, the uh, treatment that we can uh, choose and for the patient. Uh, so in primary endodontic lesions, uh, the origin of the uh, defect is a uh, uh, pulp tissue. Uh, usually we can see uh, untreated caries, depressions, transit or history of trauma. In a clinical examination, the uh, involved teeth usually have a tenderness to percussion vitality uh, pulp tests are negative and uh, if uh, we uh, probe uh, the whole mouth uh, we can see uh, a narrow deep pocket uh, with or without operation around the involved teeth. Uh, of course uh, the involved teeth may show uh, some degrees of mobility in uh, some uh, condition. Uh, the second one, primary periodontal lesion with secondary endodontic involvement. Uh, the origin of the uh, lesion is uh, periodontium, uh, the existing periodontal. Uh, you can see the existing periodontal disease that left untreated and uh, lead to destruction and inflammatory changes in pulp tissue. Uh, clinical uh, manifestation uh, uh, in the uh, general uh, probing the pocket depth uh, with uh, a narrow probing pocket depth at about this. Uh, again, uh, the teeth may have uh, some degrees of pain and some degrees of mobility. And uh, finally, the combined lesion that uh, the origin of the uh, lesion is both part and the periodon. Uh, so uh, we can have uh, some uh, this, uh, some of uh, uh, all the uh, uh, clinical manifestation that we uh, mentioned for uh, the two uh, previous uh, lesions. Oh. Uh, as you as we said earlier, uh, the etiology depends on the origin of the. Uh, deep, uh, defect and lesion in primary endo with secondary period lesion. The infection, is, uh, uh, of course, arise primarily from the pulp and uh, extend and progress apically to periodontal ligament. Uh, so, uh, in a pre primary period and secondary endodontic lesion, uh, this uh, lesion initiated uh, from a periodontal pocket that left untreated and uh, usually uh, progress apically and uh, uh, we have uh, the uh, uh, involvement of a part tissue and in combined lesion, uh, both uh, endodontic lesion and uh, uh, periodontal lesion exist at the same time and uh, progress uh, uh, to uh, reach uh, each other and uh, we have a severe destruction at the involved teeth. Uh, here is a, a point uh, about vertical fracture. Vertical fracture of a tooth is a, a clinical manifestation of this condition is really 
uh, similar uh, to uh, true combined endothelial lesions, and uh, we should uh, keep uh, this in mind and can uh, distinguish uh, these uh, uh, conditions uh, from each other. Okay, what should we do with this um, a common, very common, and uh, important uh, um, uh, condition? Uh, first of all, uh, we should uh, see if there is, uh, there is any uh, periodontal or apical abscess. If uh, there is any abscess, the abscess uh, should uh, be uh, drained. Uh, if uh, uh, there is uh, no fistula, we can uh, drain uh, the abscess uh, through a periodontal uh, process or uh, by uh, uh, endodontic treatment. Uh, uh, if uh, we have uh, abscess that is uh, flexion and uh, uh, pointing, we should uh, drain uh, the uh, periodontal or apical abscess using the uh, surgical blade. Uh, after that, uh, we should uh, uh, we should decide that uh, the uh, involved teeth is uh, maintainable and uh, treatable or not. Uh, it depends on uh, the extent uh, and the severity of uh, the disease. Uh, usually, uh, in uh, uh, primary endodontic lesion, uh, the lesion will be treated uh, while uh, uh, endodontic treatment uh, will be performed. Uh, but uh, in a primary periodontal, with secondary endodontal lesion and uh, true combined endoperial lesions, the uh, prognosis is usually uh, poor. And uh, in uh, most of the times, especially in single root teeth, if uh, we have an extensive uh, destruction of attachment apparatus, uh, the treatment of choice uh, is to extract uh, the involved teeth. And in uh, multi rooted teeth, uh, the uh, treatment modality can uh, include uh, the root reduction uh, and uh, or root amputation uh, of the involved and affected teeth. Uh, but if uh, the teeth uh, will be uh, treatable and uh, maintainable, uh, always. Always uh, treatment, uh, endodontic treatment should be performed first. Uh, and uh, then uh, the condition and uh, the improvement of sign and symptoms uh, should be uh, checked. Uh, if uh, and after usually two months, uh, we should um, uh, perform the additional periodontal treatment to uh, completely uh, resolve uh, the destruction and uh, destructive uh, progress of the lesion. Uh, if uh, the teeth uh, was unmaintainable and untreatable, untreatable uh, the last uh, choice is uh, to extract uh, the affected teeth and so replace uh, the involved teeth uh, with, uh, an, uh, with a dental implant placement. Uh, and uh, this uh, treatment modality is a predictable line term treatment in cases uh, that have uh, endoperial lesions. Uh, thank you so much. I, yeah, I hope that uh, it was useful for all of you. And if uh, there is any, uh, there are any questions, uh, I will be happy to answer you. Thank you very much, Dr. Kanuni. Thank you very much for your perfect and comprehensive presentation. I think there is one question for you in the chat box. In which situation do you prefer the decoronation procedure for complicated fractures in children? Uh, okay, in children, uh, the process is uh, uh, a little different. Uh, in children, uh, we try uh, to maintain the teeth uh, as long as possible, uh, even uh, the uh, root of the teeth. Uh, we, we prefer to maintain uh, the teeth, uh, restore it, and uh, uh, explain uh, the affected teeth uh, to the uh, other teeth, and so uh, for almost four to uh, six weeks uh, at uh, usually and mostly, and uh, then we uh, evaluate uh, the condition 
and the sign and symptoms. And uh, so then we decide if we can uh, have a, a, a determined uh, treatment plan or not. Thank you very much. Dr. Denise, I think there are a few questions from Dr. Volkan as well. I think you should unmute yourself first. Oh, yes, yes. Uh, yes. Yeah, thank you. Uh, Dr. Volkan, uh, can you hear me? Yes, Dr. Dennis. Ah, uh, yeah, we have uh, two questions uh, from the audience, from the uh, participants here. Uh, let me ask you, uh, do you prefer straight or curved forceps for abscess uh, drainage? Uh, any, uh, I mean, blunt uh, uh, dissection uh, and why? Why you choose straight or uh, curved one? Uh, in most occasions, uh, I prefer the curved one because uh, we need to reach the, the abscess center. So, for example, if we are draining a submandibular abscess, uh, the perforation of the uh, bone is uh, in lingual part. So it would be uh, much more easier uh, to reach uh, to the bone with a curved uh, mm -hmm. forceps. So, uh, for example, if we are draining a uh, buccal abscess, uh, it doesn't differ so much. Rather, the forceps is straight or curved, but uh, in places where we uh, try to reach to the lingual side of the mandible, uh, I think the curved one is uh, much more efficient. Okay, okay. Uh, I hope uh, the answer is okay for the uh, participant. And uh, the next question is the, what are the key issues or tips in the management of orbital cellulitis resulting as a complication of Ludwig's angina? Yeah, I didn't uh, saw a clinical case with both uh, presenting orbital cellulitis and uh, Ludwig's angina. So Ludwig's angina is uh, both uh, bilateral, submandibular and uh, sublingual uh, together with the submandibular space Mm -hmm. the white spaces uh, infection. So it's not a uh, focused infection, but rather uh, the situation's name. Yeah. So uh, since it's located in the mandible, uh, the orbital manifestation is, uh, I think, much more a uh, uh, peripheral mm -hmm. edema uh, rather than an uh, infection. So uh, I think uh, there is not anything to do for the management of the uh, periorbital edema if there is Ludwig, if uh, there is presence of Ludwig's angina. So uh, maybe according to my experience, or uh, I guess uh, if we uh, treat the uh, Ludwig angina, uh, then uh, the orbital or uh, cellulitis will go. Uh, I mean, heal uh, uh, at the same time. Sure, yes, uh, I agree totally. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think it's not so common to have pair orbital edema accompanied with Ludwig angina. I haven't I heard can't recall before, any yeah. cases. Mm. Yeah, it's not so common, but I it's totally agree with Dr. Volkan. Maybe a complication, need... maybe. Yeah, and I agree with Dr. Volkan, you don't need to do anything. Yeah. It will resolve uh, spontaneously, right? Yeah. Okay, and I can see someone has raised his hand. Mm -hmm. Maybe we should ask him to unmute and ask the question. Yeah, sure. Uh, There's another any, question, I think, from Dr. Volkan in the chat box. Oh, Andy. Uh, hello. Uh, hello, Dr. Tayar. I think we can hear you if you have any questions. Maybe that was an accidental touch, right? Okay, maybe we should proceed to the next question in the chat box. 
Somebody says we had a patient who presented late to hospital and actually lost sight in the left eye. Initial diagnosis was lutex angina or of odontogenic origin. Okay. Oh, okay. Maybe uh, some, uh, maybe, maybe, I think uh, there can be uh, a kind of uh, thrombosis uh, in the yeah. I mean, a secondary infection, uh, which is uh, uh, begin with the primary infection as Ludwig angina, uh, maybe a man sub submandibular uh, space abscess. And then secondarily, an infection goes through the... Uh, uh, maybe buccal uh, area, buccal space buccal area, infection, and temporal. And then you can and then go then... through the uh, facial yeah. vein uh, and uh, maybe thrombosis uh, at the uh, central uh, retinal artery yeah right uh, artery yeah and then that's why uh, he he may lost his uh, left eye yeah you're right but that's mm -hmm. not so common i mean that's so rare yeah the patient must have neglected the infection for a long long time mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and also there is a chance of uh, systemic conditions, you know, diabetes, maybe, maybe. maybe it's a complication of a cavernous thrombosis. Yeah, that's mm -hmm. another possible cause. Yeah, I totally agree. Yeah. Uh, yes, but also okay. there should be a definitely a systemic deficiency in order yeah. to <laughs> infection go that much higher. And I also think uh, buccal space is the uh, yeah, common space link between, yes, mandibular and maxillary uh, spaces. <laughs> yeah, that's it. Okay, if you don't have anything else to add, I think we can end the panel, if you agree, Dr. Mm -hmm. Denise. Uh, yes, sure. Uh, do we have any question for uh, Dr. Özkan, uh, by the way? Uh, thank you very much for your nice presentation and informative presentation, Dr. Özkan. Thank you very much. Uh, do we have any questions uh, related uh, with the uh, presentation or any contributions to Dr. Oska uh, from the participants? Uh, uh, I have a small question, uh, Dr. Oska. Uh, according to your experience, how should we decide to uh, extract a wisdom tooth or uh, stay or remain the tooth and just remove the inflammatory mucosa uh, from top of it. I mean, in a uh, pericoronitis uh, scenario. How should we decide uh, to extract the tooth or to remove the, uh, I mean, make the operaculectomy? Okay, thank you for your question. Actually, it's very important uh, part of the uh, pericoronitis treatment, actually, as I told you before. And uh, we usually uh, should check the occlusion if there is a, a third molar in the upper side, mm -hmm. uh, in the occlusion, uh, traumatic occlusion. If there is one, and if we want to stay this, we should uh, clean, uh, we should stay cleansable area. And we, we should have cleaned the distal, distal side of the, the third molar with the wedge. It's very important. Mm -hmm. It's not uh, to take the occlusal part and to stay with the distal part. But if there's no occlusal trauma, and also if the third molar uh, will be um, in the progressive bone loss uh, for the second molar, which is very important for our uh, uh, patients, and then maybe we can uh, uh, extract the third molar because usually they are not uh, in the occlusion and uh, people are not cleaning um, uh, usually in the back area of the tooth. So uh, we should uh, we should ask for the patients first if we can stay, if we can make a cleansable area. Of course, each tooth is very important for us to stay in the mouth. But if it is difficult to perform the oral hygiene procedures with the patients, then we can uh, we can shoot, we can discuss about the treatment protocol for the extraction. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay then. Thank you very much, Dr. Eskin. Uh, okay. I don't think there are any more questions. So I would like to yeah. kindly ask all the participants to turn their cameras on for the final photo. Mm -hmm.
<laughs> yeah, Dr. Shakib has joined us. Now we can share the camera here. <clears throat> Okay, I would like to ask one more time uh, from our participant to uh, turn their cameras on for the final photo. Thank you very much. Okay, better now. We're still waiting for more people to turn their cameras on. It was a very good opportunity to see you all people and look at the number of participants, 85 people at this time. It's amazing. <laughs> Okay. Is it enough, Dr. Okay. Shakib? Shall we proceed? <clears throat> okay. <laughs> so, <laughs> okay. I think. And who's responsible for taking that screenshot? Mm -hmm. Okay. <laughs> So nice to have these much people from all around the world. It's amazing. Thank yeah, you very yeah. much for participating, really. Some of them are so devoted. <laughs> Even when they're riding the car, they're still in the course. Thank you very much. <laughs> Special thanks to what I see here, Maya. Thank you very much. <laughs> Okay, so stay cheese and get ready <laughs> and get ready Not for this match. <laughs> yeah. Okay, I think we're done. Yeah. Right, yeah, thank yeah. you very much. The thank you very much. Bye. Thank you. <laughs> so see you all later in maybe next uh, uh, joint program. It was an yeah. honor working with you, Dr. Denise, and all of yes. you. Thank you very thank much, you. Dr. Wilkham. Thank, thank you, you very much, Dr. Rostan, Dr. Claudine, Dr. Moen. It was really my pleasure to get to know you all and have this amazing audience of 83 people. Thank you very much. Hope to see you soon here in person. <laughs> Thank you very much. Bye. Bye. Thank you, everyone. Bye. Bye.